Uh, today we're going to be talking primarily, uh, we're going to go over, uh, it's going to come from Joshua 24, verse 15, on the second half of it. You don't need to put up the slide yet. Everything's going to be focused on this. Yet, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's going to be my focus today as we go through this scripture and we go through um, the sermon today. Uh, yet, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I want to, I want to give a little bit more information of what's going on. Sorry, I'm, I drink a little bit of water sometimes. If you can't have fun while you're preaching, what's the point? <laughs> so, sorry, that was loud. Uh, what we have here is we have a people, Israel, has come out of the desert. Before the desert, they were in Egypt. And when they got to Egypt, they were celebrated. They were loved. And they stayed too long. 400 years too long. And they were put in slavery. And then God had to send a redeemer, Moses. And then Moses set them uh, through God's help. And the ten plagues set them free. So they saw these ten plagues that we hadn't seen before. And then after the ten plagues, they get to get set free. And as they're running away, the Egyptians decide, hey, we lost our workforce. Let's go get them. So they start chasing after them. And when they're chasing after them, God opens up the sea. They walk on dry ground through the sea. They get to the other side. The Egyptians go, hey, we're going to follow them through the sea which must have been a little interesting if God opened the sea and they're going to attack the people that God was trying to protect. I just wonder, what was in their heads? Just, you know, I think about weird things. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, I'm going to follow these guys that God's trying to protect. And he just gave us ten plagues and killed the firstborn. Yeah, that doesn't sound smart. But they do it anyway. So they start chasing, and all of a sudden the sea closes in on them, and the, the army is destroyed. Egypt has never come back to that level of power. They've been powerful, but they've never been that level of power. They were the power of the world. So then the Israelites go, and they spend a year trying to get to the promised land. They get to the promised land. They send in 12 uh, spies. They go spy the land. They, go, they, they come back with all the same report. The land is awesome. The grapes are huge. But these people have big walls. They're strong. They're scary. Two of them say, we can take it. After God had done all these miracles for them to let them free from Egypt, they got scared of the land. And ten of them said, no, we ain't going in there. So then God punishes them, and they've got to go 40 years in a desert. Walking around, wandering around, walking around. They see miracle after miracle after God. I mean, just unbelievable stuff. And while they're in the desert, they're struggling with their relationship with God. They decide, oh, we're going to serve this golden image. I'm like, wait, what? God has done all this crazy stuff for you. He's giving you manna every morning. Literally, food coming from the sky. You wake up in the morning, and there's your food. No working. Just go get it. And then they complain about it. I don't like manna. I'm tired of manna. It tastes funny. I must admit, I like pizza, but if I were to eat pizza every day, I'd get sick of pizza too. But God is doing all these miracles for these guys. Their clothes aren't wearing out. Their shoes aren't wearing out. Which I understand for guys, this is a good thing. But for some of our ladies, they can't buy shoes. It might not be such a good thing. And they're seeing these miracles every day. We need water. Water comes out from a rock. They see these miracles. God is doing great things. He even has one time, and this, even though it was destruction, the earth opens up. People fall into it, and then it closes. They're shown God's power in ways that we, like, wow. It's hard for us to imagine unless we put it on television and we have to use CGI to figure it out. But they keep 
trying to serve the gods that they served while they were in slavery. And they never give themselves fully over to him. But then they finally get, after that generation is destroyed, they finally go into the promised land. And you think now they'll serve God. And they do. Go ahead and put up Joshua 1, 6-9. God, Joshua's a little nervous because he's got to fill Moses' shoes. Moses, one of the greatest prophets that was human, he has to fill those shoes. And he's a little nervous about it. So in Joshua 1, 6-9, God says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall provide the land that I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance for this people. Be strong and very courageous, in order to act carefully in accordance with the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn aside from it to the right or the left, or the left so that you may succeed wherever you go. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may act carefully according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and you will be wise. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So this is what God is telling Joshua, who's scared to lead these people. He's saying, be strong and courageous. And just those four verses, he says, be strong and courageous three times. And then they go into the land. And they walk around a uh, a town that has walls so thick, they got their houses built out of it, and the walls fall down. And then they have the day that goes long. A whole extra day, or half a day goes long. It's recorded in almost every culture's history books of this day that went long. And the miracle there, I could preach on that for the, that's the whole sermon in itself. I'm not going to spend too much time. But understand that our earth spins at a thousand miles per hour. And when you stop that, what's going to happen? You fly off. God held everything together to make that day go longer. And they see these miracles. And miracle after miracle, as they're taking over the land, and they're removing the people of the land, and they're taking their inheritance, they're seeing it over and over again. God's miracle power, His awesome power, His strong power, constantly happening. They're seeing it with their own eyes. And then when we get to the end of Joshua... Joshua 24, 14 to 18, it says this. Now fear the Lord and serve him with serenity and faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it is displeasing to you to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. If it should be the gods of your fathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorite land where you are now living, yet as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua gives them this challenge. They can continue to serve the gods that they wanted to serve on the other side, the gods that they had been around, or serve God. It was their choice. He gave them the choice. You and I today, we have that choice. They wanted to serve those gods and serve God. But God is a jealous God. He doesn't like it when we try to serve other gods while we're serving Him. They get in the way. And I'll spend some more time on that after I read this next part, which is 16 to 18. The people then answered and said, God forbid that we forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers out from slavery in the land of Egypt and performed these great signs in our sight and guarded us from all the way that we went went in among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in the land. So we will indeed serve the Lord, for he is God. So that's what the people said. (sighs) 
They said, we will serve the Lord. That was their commitment. The next book of the Bible, Judges. You ever read Judges? It didn't go very well. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse until God has to set up a king. And then he sets up a king. And if the king served the God, served God, then the people served God. If the king didn't serve God, the people didn't serve God. Yet here, they make their commitment. And what we're going to talk about today is you have a choice. You have a choice today to serve God or serve other things. Serve the idols of the land in which we're living. It's your choice. No one can make it before you. Your mama cannot make it for you. Your dad can't make it for you. Your kids can't make it for you. Your husband or your wife cannot make it for you. It's your choice. You get to choose whether or not I want to serve God or serve the idols in the land. And I get that this is tough for us. It always is. This idea of idol worship is tough because... We don't see as much of it in our culture today as the traditional. They got the little wooden statue, the burning incense, and they're sacrificing animals to it in their homes. I don't know too many people that do that. However, we have other idols in our lives. We have things that we allow to come up before God with us. One of the things that, um, that we have is all these distractions that we allow to run our lives. We have certain things like when you're having a tough day. It's been long. I work in daycare. The kids are yelling. They've been screaming all day, disrespectful. So you come home, you put on the TV, and you go. You're tired. You're stressed out. You have different jobs. You're tired. You're stressed out after work. You come home. You turn on the TV, and you go. And you do that for two hours just to try to get rid of the problem that you're having. Well, the reality is after that two hours, the problem's still there. What, is, what, what, what does that scenario just show us? Instead of going to God to fix your problem, would he can actually do that? You went to the television to fix your problem. Can the TV fix it? Now, it can be a tool. You can use it maybe, you know, if you're watching a couple sermons, you're watching something inspirational. But then you have to do something. When to really fix your problem, come home, spend 30 minutes in prayer, and then watch the problem go away, you'll feel a lot better. And rather than taking two hours, you've done 30 minutes, and now you've got an extra hour and a half to your life. See, we mix in these idols in our lives. Me, I like video games. And I'll be honest, sometimes I would do it, I'd try to just to escape. That's a problem. If I need an escape, where should I go? To God. If I'm going to something else to escape my problems, is that an idol? Yeah. It is. It is. Some of us like football teams. You come in my house, you go to my bathroom, my wife has something really cool. It is a fat head helmet. It's this big. I'm not joking. It's huge. And we have cowboy stuff. Because if we like the cowboys, I know this is Pat's land. We like the Cowboys, and we enjoy football, but we enjoy it. We don't serve it. We like the colors. I like blue and silver. It's my favorite colors. But there's a difference, and I even asked the daycare kids. I said, do you guys think that I serve the Cowboys or I serve Jesus? And they all looked at me, and they see me stressed out, worried, tired, Usually it's their fault. And they looked at me, no, you love Jesus more. There's no question. 
But I'll be honest, if I were to take Joshua into my home and show him my house, he's going to see images of Christ. He's going to see images of Disney stuff. He'll see lighthouses and he'll see cowboy stuff. He may think that we have idols. When Michael Jackson, Jackson sorry, passed away, there were constant showings of these shrines people put in their homes where they're burning incense to Michael Jackson's picture. I've been in some homes, you know, we have middle school girls that love boy bands. And now you can put that image in your head, boy band pictures everywhere. And some of this stuff becomes an idol. God's got to be first. He doesn't want anything else before him. He is a jealous God. He's serious about that. They made the commitment, we're going to serve God. They tried. And they, some of them got eaten up by the earth. Some of them got eaten up by a plague. They had to build a golden statue, and if they looked at the snake statue, they were healed. And then later, they start worshiping the statue. And one of the kings had to tear it down. Something God created for good, and they used it for good, got turned to evil. The devil loves to do that in your life. You may have something. Entertainment is not a problem. It's when entertainment is now your God, we got a problem. He wants you to have fun. He loves jokes. Come on. They were like, you need to pay your taxes. You're like, okay, go fishing. They go fishing. They pull out a fish, open its mouth. It's got a coin in it to pay the taxes. I'm sorry, that's funny. I mean, think about it. Jesus hung out with fishermen. They're stinky. They go fishing. They enjoyed fishing, getting away, go fishing. But that wasn't their God. They, the early Christians, not only had church for Jesus, and they'd do the home studies and the, the home church, they went to synagogue. They still went to Jewish synagogue. Why? That's where the people are they wanted to show Jesus to. They still went to synagogue. They didn't allow other things to get in front of that. You don't go fishing during synagogue time. You're in synagogue. Later, afterwards, not on the Sabbath. See, today we allow all kinds of stuff to get in the way. Sometimes we enjoy hiking. Sometimes we enjoy fishing. We like going out on the lake. We want to do sports. And all this stuff now happens a lot on Sunday. And then you miss church. If you're missing church for an for, uh, extracurricular or an entertainment activity on a regular basis, now what's your God? I mean, seriously, look inside. God is jealous, and then we wonder why he doesn't heal and move and do these miracles for us. I, I grew up in an area where they, we didn't have sports on Sundays. I played soccer. Somebody got the great idea. Hey, we got this whole day. No soccer games planned. Let's do soccer at 9 to 4 o'clock on Sundays. You know what happened? Less than 50% of the kids showed up. Our parents were not going to allow us to play soccer when it's God's time. You know what the rec league had to do? Stop having games during church. They didn't have enough kids. Every game was a forfeit. So, and I get, we live in our world, and in Maine, we've got 3%, 3% of Maine is evangelical, only 1% of Maine actually shows up to church on a Sunday morning. It is the lowest. I just had some Indian friends um, over my house on Sunday. India has such higher numbers. And there's churches in secret. They find out you're a Christian, you're dead. It 
it's sad. This is where we're at. I mean, Maine has some great things. We still have some blue law, so that way, if you like Black Friday shopping, I do, you get to go out on Friday. Now, everywhere else in almost all the other states, it's Black Thursday, it's Black Thanksgiving shopping. Starts now at 4 o'clock. Not in Maine. We have that blue law. Because it was founded with Christian values, and we hold some of those still. Oh, so many people are lost. I go home. I can talk to anyone in Walmart. And go, hey, what church you go to? And they'll have a story, you know, what church they go to. Sometimes they're in between churches. Sometimes it's been a couple of weeks, but this is the church they go to, and they'll tell me all this stuff. You do that here in Maine, they look at you like, what? I ain't never been to church. My great-grandmother was offended in church, and therefore we don't go to church. We allow these idols, these small things, they get in our lives, and they stop, they stop having God be a priority. Remember, He's your Savior. He went to a cross, died on a cross for you and your sins. He did that for us. All we have to do is accept Him, believe Him, and follow after Him. And then he said, make me Lord. And he says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. And we have this beautiful image of the cross, and sometimes we make it too nice. How about I say it like this? Take up your, your electric chair and follow me. Take up your hangman's noose and follow me. Take up the executioner's axe and follow me. What do those images show? If they killed our Jesus, what do you think they're going to do to us? It's life is not about us. And that's a transformational thing. In America, we are very independent. We are very self-centered. We are very individualistic. I mean, we cannot have we without two eyes. I love that joke. I say it all the time. We think about ourselves. How is this going to affect me? Well, I'm going to let you know, nothing just affects you. You have somebody in your house who gets caught up in drug addiction. It's going to affect everybody. You have somebody in your house that does something wrong, goes to jail. It now affects other people. If you choose to live rightly and live righteously and follow God, even if you don't see it, it now affects everybody else because now they know what's right and what's wrong. You're following Jesus. Some people don't like, to, like you being around. Why? Because they like this idea that they're sinning and no one's calling them out on it. Well, you're not calling them out. You're just doing what's right. But now that you're doing what's right, they know what they're doing is wrong. And you don't even know their name. Choose. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Make your choice. Are you going to continue to serve the gods of this world? Are you going to serve God? He doesn't like sharing. I mean, there's scripture that really always puts a check in my heart. I'm a pastor. I've been following Jesus my whole life. But that scripture about they cast out demons in my name and depart from me, I never knew you, scares me to death. It's been a while since I've cast out a demon. Think about it. He says, I want to be Lord. Which is more than president. But if you've got a busy schedule, you got something really important to do, and I get, you know, you got some difficulties, and we don't want to, you know, oh man, Sunday's in the way. If the president were to call you on the phone and say, I want to meet with you, and you got that same schedule, what's going to happen to your schedule? It just changed. You're going to meet with the president. 
whether you like him or not, it's the president. But if you don't like him, now you got some stuff you want to tell him. You get to meet with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all nations, all earth, even the bugs on the ground, and he asks to meet with you and wants to spend some time with you and doesn't want anything else to get in the way. More powerful. He can heal your sickness. He can help you get a better job. He can do all kinds of miracles. We've been praying on Sundays. Pastors let me know. I'm not always in here. I don't always know all the extra ones. Praying for favor and jobs that people would receive raises. Testimony. God just gave me and my wife a, a raise. I mean, he's powerful. We weren't even in here. You guys were praying for it, and we didn't know. I got the raise, and I told him about it, and he goes, well, we've been praying for that. I said, wow. I mean, that's the God you serve. He loves you. He went to that cross, not on accident. The cross never killed him. He gave himself up. I mean, come on, he's Jesus. All right, as they're taking him, Peter chops a guy's ear off, he picks up the ear, sticks it back on the guy's head. You think that if you chopped his arm off, he'd grab his arm, stick it back on. I mean, if you are a Marvel fan, where do you think Stan Lee got some of his ideas for these superpowers? He looked at Jesus. You can't kill Jesus. Thousands of angels would ta take you out. He chose. And the crazy thing is he chose to go through the whole cross process. He could have died in his sleep. Same sacrifice. He didn't choose that. He chose to do it in a way that it would matter to us. And on that cross he goes, it is finished, and he dies. And then they're all surprised. They're all like, he's dead already. Cross is a five to seven day, five to seven days it normally takes to kill him. He's dead. That's what we miss. Romans were very confused. Why? They do this all the time, and he's already dead. They didn't know what to do with it. Well, I guess take him down. Pierce his heart, make sure, you know, that he is dead. He loves you. So much. Go on to the next slide of the Matthew. One of the hardest things for us is we have to choose to serve God or the devil. So we've talked about all these different idols in our lives, and when we make them idols, we worship them. What happens? There's two kingdoms that we get to serve, God or the devil, which means all religion that doesn't point to Jesus and God serves who? The devil. All non-religions that don't point to God, well, they're non-religions, who are they serving? The devil. we got two kingdoms at war all the time. And you're either serving one or the other. You can't choose both. In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible. That's why God said in Joshua, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve me? Are you going to serve the idols. You can't pick both. They kept trying to pick both, and that's why we have the Bible in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. we got Judges. It doesn't work. If you need experience in it, just read it. They kept trying to serve both. Solomon, the wisest of them all. Even the wise men were surprised at how wise he was. He had way too many wives. One's enough for me to keep up with. And 
they loved their gods, and he allowed them to continue serving their gods and even built temples to their gods, and then it turned his heart. That's why God doesn't want you to have other idols in your life. It's not that he's a mean, hateful, angry God. He doesn't want you to have other gods in your lives because he knows you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other, and over time, you're going to probably start loving the other and forget about him or become stagnant with him. He doesn't want that. He wants you. He wants to be Lord. He wants to have you completely in his mind. Um, go ahead to Deuteronomy 30, 15 to 20. Moses, the guy who preceded Joshua, gave this challenge to the Israelites in, his, in Deuteronomy. And if you don't know what Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is Moses' sermon to the people because he knows he's not going into the promised land. It's a really long sermon. So when you get upset about sermons going long, read all of Deuteronomy and go, man, at least it's not that long. Just saying. See, uh, see, today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and disaster. What I'm commanding you today is to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments, and to teach and his, sorry, commandments, and his statutes and his judgments, so that you may live and multiply. Then the Lord your God will bless you and in the land in which you will go per, to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not obey him, but are drawn away and worship the other gods and serve them, then I declare to you today that you will surely perish and that you will not prolong your days in the land in which you are crossing the Jordan to go and possess. In 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and give them. He says, choose life. To serve God is life. It's not a curse. To choose the devil is death. If you don't know this, why would people leave these things to serve God? You get the richest people around committing suicide. Why? Life is meaningless. They have all the women, all the money, all the televisions, all the cars, all the golf trips they could want. But they don't have Jesus. Life means nothing. Without Him... It is destruction. I am blessed. I got to serve Jesus. I accepted Jesus at a young age. He not only saved me from the sins I had committed since I was four years old. He saved me from the sins I would have committed had I never served him. What's crazy is people go, well, God knows my heart. I said, yeah, what does he say about that? Your heart is evil, des despicable, is the worst, most evil thing there is. Heart is terrible. I know my heart. It's terrible. I have to constantly put it in submission to God. I'm scared. I don't know what I would have been had I not had Jesus at a young age. Because the temptations I got, I'm like, man, what would I be? I can't blame sinners for being sinners because they don't have Jesus. But when you accept him, you get saved from a tons of sins that you would have committed because now you know and his Holy Spirit instructs you and teaches you and keeps you from doing wrong. And he saves you from so many things. Why? He loves you. He loves you. He knows that the path of serving the devil never works out. 
You may die with a lot of money and things, but there's a hole in your heart. You keep trying to fill it with any kind of thing you can. Right now, heroin is a huge epidemic, taking so many of our kids. Why? They're trying to fill a void that can't be filled no matter how many drugs you take. People want all this drug stuff. They want drugs left and right. It, what happens when the high worms out? They feel depressed, lonely, and nothing is fixed. You want to really know peace? Come to the altar of Jesus. Get rid of the idols in our lives. And that might not even be a bad thing. It might just be something that, you know, oh, man, I really like to bake. But I find myself baking all the time and not doing anything else. Not serving Jesus. And I'm not saying against jobs. Jesus, you know, there's, I haven't seen any commandments against working. Because they're not there. When we go to heaven, we will work. Some of us don't like that thought. But the curse of work will be taken away. It'll be a joy. I work with kids. You know what they're doing? They grab little lawnmowers and they go around and they lawn mow the ground. I look at them and go, man, I hate lawn mowing. I hate it. You know, they're sitting cooking and they're washing dishes. Man, I don't like washing dishes and cooking. You know, they got their fake clothes, and they'll act like they're washing their clothes like mommy and daddy do. I'm like, man, I don't like doing that anymore. As kids, it was fun. And then when it becomes jobs and we got to do it for work, man, it's not as much fun anymore. But guys, God loves you so much. He wants you to know. As Pastor Tony has been talking about, you know, we come to the church. Don't just come to church, but be the church. You have a choice in that too. But it requires an action. You can come and sit and watch and enjoy every Sunday and not do anything with it. Many of our consumer mentality here in America has come, I go to church, I go to this church because it has this, 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 and this. It's, it's like going to the mall, and I go to this store because it has this, this, and this, and I go over to this store because it has this, this, and this. It's not why we go to church. We go to church to meet with God and meet with his people. And while you're in the church, you're his body. You're the work of his hands. You're a precious creation. He died on a cross for you. He sacrificed everything for you. He brought you to salvation. There's some, tons of people that have it. But he chose you. He worked. He sent somebody. Somebody told you about Jesus. That somebody cared enough to tell you. And when you're in church, it's not about what I can get. It's about what you can give. Choose to be a part of the church, to be the church, to do something. And that way, when you ever have to move the church or move away, we miss you. And that's your choice. There's tons of places where you can get plugged in and work and do the work of the Lord and be filled. I can't tell you how many people, new Christians, I've had work in children's ministry for a while and teaching the kids the basic Bible lessons taught them more than the kids were learning to grow them more spiritually than what they would get just sitting in service not that sitting in service is bad please don't get me wrong with that. I miss not I enjoy whenever I get to hear Pastor Tony live I get to watch him on YouTube but God has a purpose for your life. If you choose him, choose him fully. Give him your time, your talents, and make sure any of the other idols in the land don't control you. 
but they don't control you. You can enjoy them, you know, going to the lake, watching TV, playing video games, enjoying music. None of that's wrong. If it takes his place, who are you serving? I'll end on one quick one before we do it. We're going to do a video, and then we'll conclude. Uh, my wife, when we first got married, we were looking at... That'll be the video in a moment. My wife, when we first got married, um, we were trying to find something that we both agree on because I like action and fantasy, and she doesn't. She likes Little House on the Prairie. And so we found wrestling we both like because she liked the drama of wrestling, uh, and I like the action. So we were watching it uh, for a first couple, you know, about a year and a half or so. We were married, and she noticed something that she had to be home on Monday night. It didn't matter. We had a church event. We got to get out of here. Got to get home. We were doing something. We were out to eat with some friends from the church. Well, we got to get home. Got to watch my show. You know, Thursday and Monday. Me, I just liked it. She was like, Adam, and then she looked at me one day and goes, Jimmy, it's become an idol. Says, I got to be home to watch it. It's a problem. So we stopped watching. Just turn it off. And we'll watch, you know, I don't even, can't even, maybe twice in the last five years, watch the show. But we had to remove that idol out of our life. And it's not that it was a bad thing. It was, a, it was a, something that we both enjoyed together, and we were having problems finding something we liked together. And it was a healthy marriage thing. It was a nice time together. But it became an idol. Don't let those little things control your life. Let's watch this video. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor who taught at both universities, used to emphasize... He said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. And the youth of our day seem sometimes to be obsessed with the fact of hell. You know, I used to take a little book, maybe I still take it, uh, of song hits, and I would read the lyrics. That's back when Franklin, my son, and my other children were going through that stage. And my wife and I tried to keep up with the loud noises coming from their room and what they were listening to. And constantly you hear a song today called Highway to Hell. The Meatloaf sing Bad Out of Hell. And the ACDC sing Hell's Bells. And there's a group in England that are singing at the top of the charts right now called The Damned. So you see, Young people talk about it. They think about it. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now. Waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships comradeships and influences and there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. You're asked to cast a vote and you go
go in and you pull the string and the curtain pulls around you and you vote for Christ or for the other gods. Which has your priority? That's the great question. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation. This faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafler is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past. But you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. When I um, was finishing my study on this and creating it, I found that video. From 1981, before I was born, not too long before I was born, before I was born, and he hit most of the points I wanted to make. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to conclude, I'm going to ask the elders to come forward, we're going to have a time at the altar here. It is your choice, I thought that was a pretty good image too. It's your choice of what you want to do. Choose for this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue doing what you're doing, trying to serve too, or are you just going to serve God fully? Are you going to put some action to your faith? Say you believe in Jesus. Are you going to start doing something with it? It's up to you. The altars will be open if you...